Now, I'd like to introduce a dear friend of mine, an avid participant of the Stanford SUMA community, Dr. Gabriel Washington. He's a Stanford undergrad and a Stanford Medical School alumni as well. He has a passion for advocacy and has worked on a number of initiatives to increase diversity in medicine and has advocated on the behalf of students of color throughout his time at Stanford. He takes, he takes a hands-on approach to, on issues that impact his community and has spent time in medical school working on projects that design therapies for sickle cell disease, an illness that largely impacts the Black community and is also an area of research that has traditionally been sorely underfund underfunded. He's currently a first-year anesthesia resident at, Mass at the Massachusetts General Hospital and is planning to pursue fellowship before returning back home to Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, I introduce you to Dr. Gabe Gabriel Washington, our keynote speaker for the 30th anniversary of the SUMA conference. Thank you so much for the introduction, Job. Um, and thank you so much for everyone for the invitation to speak. Stanford is truly a place where I feel like I grew so much as a person. And it's really exciting to hear from everyone and everyone's stories from some of the community members that I met during my time there. I'm honored, beyond honored, to speak at this year's 30th annual SUMA conference. I get to help commemorate a conference that's been uplifting and empowering members of our community since I was born. I get to help celebrate an organization that helped me achieve my goal when I first set out to become a doctor 10 years ago, and I had absolutely no clue how to do it. Like me, countless others have been touched by the work of the volunteers, organizers, and leadership of this conference. And it is my distinct pleasure to take a moment to thank the people involved with this year's event. This year's virtual conference is a testament to what we can accomplish and resilience that we can still adapt and thrive even when things don't go as planned. We have over 800 attendees this year, 800 motivated individuals that will join us in improving the healthcare system for all. And that is truly inspiring. This year's theme is a dream pursued. A dream pursued. It's a spin on a poem entitled Harlem by Dr. By Langston Hughes, which Nia mentioned. And it referenced, it's referenced in Lorraine Hansberry's play, A Raisin in the Sun. And this is how it goes. What happens? to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? The theme of this year's conference is powerful, especially in today's time when so many things happening around us seem to be out of our control. Or are they? In contrast, I'd like to talk about what happens to a dream pursued. Or more accurately, a dream in active pursuit. I'd like to tell you about my journey and some of the lessons I've learned and continue to learn along the way. My first point, write your own story and will it into existence. When I was five years old, I remember I was in front of my church at Sunday school when they asked all of the children what they wanted to be when they grew up. I couldn't have been more than four feet tall when they got to me and asked me what I wanted to be. My response was the president of the United States. I still remember everyone in the congregation smiling, some soft laughter, all of the encouragement I felt in that moment. As I grew up, I started to realize that my calling was more local to my community. I'd seen my grandparents and my father serve our community through the church, and I grew up to realize that I wanted to give back as well. Even as a child, I'd recognize so much inequity around me, and I was motivated to pursue politics to change policy and create opportunity for those around me. So when I started undergrad in 2009, I had every intention on becoming a lawyer and then returning to Las Vegas to do grassroots advocacy. 
But when I arrived on campus, I was introduced to career opportunities I had never entertained. Some of which I'd never even heard of. I mean, what was computer science? I was actually in Ecuador doing a volunteer program when I had a conversation that would forever change my trajectory. I was talking to an upperclassman named Ariana who had just finished her first year in human biology and was super excited. She told me what she learned about sickle cell disease that year. And in one sitting, I learned more about the biological basis of sickle cell disease than I know in my entire life. And that was a surprise to me because you see, I have two sisters who have sickle cell disease. And in my 18 years of life to that point, with experiences with them, I'd never known it. I'd seen them suffer with bouts of pain, pain crises that were so bad that they couldn't walk. I'd seen them hospitalized for days on end. And then even recently, I'd seen them kicked out of hospitals and labeled as drug seekers. All of this, all of this experience, and I did not know that the same mutation that caused their disease actually protected me from malaria. Being curious, I started to do my own research to find out what other information had been hiding from me about sickle cell disease. I became completely submerged in my research, uncovering completely new things that I'd never known. I eventually found out that even though sickle cell disease was the very first genetic disease linked to a mutation, there were almost no innovative therapies to treat these patients. The best therapy, the standard of care, was actually a drug called hydroxyurea, which was formerly a chemotherapy. To add insult to injury, I learned that there was several times less funding devoted to research from both private and government sources. Seeing how underfunded sickle cell disease was reminded me of the many injustices I'd seen in my entire life. And it actually became clear to me that I could combine my newfound passion for medicine with my interest in advocacy by pursuing a career in medicine. So since then, the rest was history and I pursued medicine full force. This was a pivotal experience for me. I mean, it's a huge change to go from political science, a path that I'd paved since I was five years old, to medicine. But that summer, I felt like I had direction. And so I devised a plan to switch my major to human biology and start my pre-med coursework. All of these people, these really smart people are switching out of pre-med. You sure you wanna do that? Remember that chemistry AP exam in high school that you bombed? Bro, you got a 26 on that midterm out of 100. It's not too late to re-enroll in political science. And are you really gonna take that MCAT again? By the way, even if you get in, how are you gonna pay for medical school? At so many points along the process, I question whether I should continue. But at each turn, I could also see myself fulfilling my purpose for my family and for my community. Every glimpse I got of the future helped me to continue trudging along, determined to find new ways to excel and meet the challenges in front of me. Growth mindset. It's the belief that an ability can be developed through hard work and dedication. It's in contrast to a fixed mindset where one is either born with an ability to do chemistry or not. I believed firmly in growth mindset, and I'll tell you why. So in high school, I ran track. I started my freshman year and I was a hurdler. And when I started out, I was slow. Let me say that again, I was slow. So slow that someone once fell in a race, got back up and still beat me. No lie. Fast forward, three years later, I placed fourth in the state meet, beating that same competitor. Similar to my desire to see myself improve in track, I had a firm sense of what I wanted to accomplish for my loved ones in medicine. They anchored me and I could not be swayed. I share that story to say, only you have the power to write your own story. Only you decide who you'll become. Not a pre-med counselor, not a bad grade or a test score, not a negative classmate or a pessimistic professor. 
I want you to take a moment to think to your anchor. For me, it's my family, my faith, and my city. For you, it could be your grandmother's experience with medical care, your childhood dream. What keeps bringing you back to this pursuit despite the various challenges? And there will be challenges. And besides the coffee, when you're pulling those all-nighters, what keeps bringing you back? Don't forget your anchor, or what Abu Rogers mentioned was your why medicine. And when you're taking a ride on a struggle bus, and trust me, we all take our turn on the struggle bus, hold that anchor closer than ever. You've got to write your own story and will it into existence. And you will become the community physician, the pediatrician, or neurosurgeon, or radiation oncologist. You can become the next Dean Gibbs of Stanford Medicine. Part of you being here today tells me that you already know how to do this. You already know how to write your own story. And I'm just giving you a friendly reminder. If you continue to write your own story, your life will be the embodiment of a dream pursued. In our path to medicine, I recognize that many of us are the first in our family to go on this journey, which brings me to my second point. Your roots are a source of strength. The combination of experiences that brought you here are powerful. So allow them to propel you. I remember going to my great grandmother's house as a kid, my grandma Cleo. She had a photo in her entryway that always caught my attention. It was a black and white photograph with 16 people, adults and children, all dressed up in their Sunday best, the kids in the front all barefoot. My great grandma Cleo would point to the picture of the baby and point out that that would become her mother. She would tell me about her upbringing, absolutely amazing stories of resilience that to her were just the realities of life. This photo, it is Black History Month. This photo was the first of my family prior to their travel from Louisiana to Oklahoma. The matriarch in this photo, who you can see next to the baby, lived part of her life in slavery. For me, this portrait was a not so distant reminder of this country's past and the limited opportunities that existed and exist even to this day. My great, great, great grandfather is depicted here. A man who worked as a form of veterinarian tending to farm animals like cows and horses. And my great, great, great grandmother is also depicted here. A woman who worked as a midwife, delivering babies, even performing abortions and treating illnesses. So when I first told my mom about my decision to go into medicine instead of law, she was not feeling it. But one day she eventually came around. She had a change of heart and she called me and reminded me that this was in my bloodline. You know, I can only imagine that I must be the wildest manifestation of my great great grandparents' dreams. Because of my ancestors' sacrifices and my, my family's hard work, I can. All of them persisting, providing, and at times thriving against impossible odds. This was all valuable and it was all necessary. So I'll say yes. I am the first in my family to graduate college and medical school, and I'm technically the first medical doctor in my family's known lineage. But I am not the first to work hard or the first to find a new path in unfamiliar territory. And I don't think I'd be here without the prayers and effort of the many generations before me. This gives me strength. I encourage you. Remember and derive strength from your rich history, whether it be first generation in America, like Rosie so vulnerably shared, first to pursue higher education, first in medicine. 
It is a source of strength and the foundation you stand on is sound. Many of us have a strong sense of connectedness. We're connected to our natural or adopted families, our history, our shared experiences. We've also increasingly realized that we're connected to one another's experiences and struggles. And more recently, we're connected to one another's mourning. 2020 has brought our fight for racial justice and equity to the forefront by highlighting some of the ugliest truths of our reality. Sadly, these things have been true for decades and will take much time to improve. But remember, the foundation laid by those before us is strong. It's up to us to do our part to continue to build and write our collective future in a way that pays respects to those that came before us a collective dream pursued. As you advance in medicine, remember to pay it forward. Give back to the community just as it has nourished you. And at each step, your progress is valuable to someone, never forget that. As you climb, remember to reach back and bring others along the way. My last story and the last point I wanna share with you today is to bring all of yourself every step of the way and know that you are enough and you are valuable. My most prized role, my most prized title is being a father. And here is my 11 year old son, Zylan. He is my drive, my anchor. Don't he look just like me? He has a deep love of Fortnite and Minecraft and aspires to become a video game designer. He actually convinced me to buy stock in GameStop a year and a half ago. So he's also a gifted financial analyst. He lives in our hometown of Las Vegas with his mother and the rest of our families. I'll be honest, it has not always been easy parenting from afar and it goes without saying, but I've relied greatly on his mother and our families for support along the journey. It truly has taken a village. I remember when I first found out that I was going to become a father. I was working retail at Nike at a time, really excited uh, about my 40% discount. I worked at a fancy mall on the strip. I thought I was doing big things, but recognizing my new responsibility, I considered staying in Vegas. One day I was in class talking to my friend about my decision to stay home when one of my teachers asked me to come out of the classroom. She apparently had overheard my conversation and had some words that she wanted to share with me. She said, you will go to Stanford and you will not stay here. She told me that I could be a good father and pursue my dreams and that the two were not mutually exclusive. She actually encouraged me to lead by example for my son by pursuing my dreams and not to allow the blessing of parenthood to lead me to regret my decisions for my future. She reminded me that I could write my own story for how this would all play out and that it would take work, but it was definitely possible. Over 10 years later, two teenage parents are working together to raise a son who doesn't conceive of a reality where he does not go to college, a dream pursued. Along this journey, being a young, unmarried father away from my son has occasionally revealed just how starkly different my life circumstances are from those around me. In my hometown, being a young father does not make me stand out in any way or bring any extra attention. However, along the path in medicine, I've had a handful of encounters that have illuminated just how underrepresented my experience is in this field. I recall telling one undergrad classmate about my son in conversation and him thinking I was trying to trick him. <laughs> I also recall a medical school classmate asking me about my relationship with my baby mama. Cringe. More commonly, I encounter silence, maybe from surprise, followed by a glance toward my ring finger, followed by a question about my age or a comment about how young I am. At times, 
it feels as though I can see people's minds doing the calculus. How is he a father at this age? How is he here? And where is his child? At times, I know my presence challenges the worldview of my peers and opens their minds to new ways of being. I must mention though, for each of the awkward reactions or interactions, there are others who ask, what's your son into? Or show me a picture. Whether or not your experience is being a parent or being a person of color or a religious minority, LGBT, disabled, you will undoubtedly face interactions that remind you how underrepresented people from your community are in medicine. Never dim your presence. Different ways of life need to be seen and understood. And I'll admit, it is not always easy. But by sharing who I am, I have helped those around me to better understand their future patients. By increasing diversity in medicine, all 800 plus of you can amplify that impact. Stand out in ways that make you unique because so many people coming behind you stand to gain from your presence. What I continue to learn above all is that when you don't share who you are, it's hard to reach your full potential. It can weigh on you and even distract you from your progress on this path. I want to encourage you to bring all of you everywhere you go on this journey, growing in ways that you can and maintaining those things that make you unique because medicine truly needs you. This pandemic has made that clear when so many of our communities are disproportionately affected and we have a healthcare system that many in our communities are hesitant to trust. We need you to relate to our patients and show them that they are represented and understood. We need you to be liaisons to our communities and protect their health from bias in a medical system that assumes they feel less pain than their white counterparts. We need you to combat racism to try, that tries to link a virus to people of Asian descent. We need you to make sure black women are heard and taken seriously in the delivery room because they're more likely to die during childbirth. We need you to educate your community on health initiatives to promote mental health and healing. And we need you like Thomas to do the research that will lead to innovative therapies for diseases that afflict our people. We need you to care for our native communities that have been sorely under-resourced and left unequipped to handle this virus. We need you to change the face of medicine so that the next generation realizes there's a place for them to write their own story. And we need you to demonstrate what life looks like when a unique dream is pursued because our dreams were never meant to dry up. Thank you. I wanna thank you so much again. I'm so honored to be speaking to you all today. I um, would love to talk more. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, join my Q&A session later.